Christ is in our midst. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are in our midst. They are not. I knew he wouldn't know what to do with that. Well, we've got these two trays of uh, candles lighted here. For those of you who participated in our Memorial Day prayer service yesterday, you know where they came from, and we thought it would be appropriate to have them lighted this morning. But then some of you are going to be fixated on the candle that will not light on the left-hand side. We don't know what's up with that. There's probably some weird spirit hanging around over there. You would think that preaching on Trinity Sunday would be more or less like preaching on any other Sunday of the church year. But we priests and preachers from all Christian traditions tend to dread it. Why would we dread it, you ask? Well, I'm glad you asked. It's because in our little priestly, pastoral, preacher minds, we sometimes are afraid that you, the layperson at large, the ominous congregation of the faithful, might expect us to have all the answers to life's most difficult questions. And the Trinity is one of the most difficult. Back in 1990, a movie came out that was one of those silly, mostly pointless slapstick comedies that contained a few comical gems here and there. But in the end, you wonder why you wasted money to go to the theater. It was called Nuns on the Run. It starred Eric Idle of the Monty Python's Flying Circus and another British comedian, Robbie Coltrane. The premise was that the two main characters double cross their criminal losses to make up with money from a bank robbery, and in the process of running away, they duck into a convent. At that point, the only logical thing they can think of doing to save their lives is to become nuns. And so they don nuns' habits and speak in falsetto and integrate themselves into the everyday routines of the convent into the school. I always suggest that you watch the movie if you have two hours to waste that you don't care if you ever get back. But I bring it up because at one point in the movie, some young student asks these fake nuns to explain the Trinity. After some hooping and hawing, Robbie Coltrane finally answers, Well, you know, the Trinity is a bugger. Now, as inappropriate as that is, it's also as true a theological statement as I can muster. My options are somewhat limited when faced with both congregation and a need to preach on the Trinity at the same time. I can start pulling out more books and notes than usual and try to explain the Trinity to everybody's satisfaction. But a sermon that seriously attempted to accomplish that would take the rest of the day at least. And we'd have to take long breaks and order out pizza and sandwiches and drink endless cups of coffee and run through the sprinkler, things like that, just to stay awake. When it was all over, none of us would feel like we understood it any better anyhow. It took the church over 400 years to figure out exactly what it thought about the Trinity, but really it was what it thought it could try to say about what it thought about the Trinity. And we really are still working on it. I could just say that the Trinity is a mystery beyond human comprehension, which of course it is. And then I could smile politely and step down from the pulpit. Let the Nicene Creed do the preaching for me. Maybe that option would prompt applause from some of you. <laughs> Maybe I'd even get a couple of laughs. But it wouldn't be very satisfying. I choose a third option. And my third option assumes that the Trinity does not have to be explained from the pulpit on Trinity Sunday, or explained any time. For those who care enough to think about it, the idea of the Trinity is fodder for endless discussions in Sunday school or small groups or hushed conversations in taverns and restaurants. My third option chooses celebration 
over explanation. And I think that's a level of constructive. Today we celebrate the Trinity. God as three and three as one in profound unity. But we don't necessarily want to explain it. We celebrate our God as we humans living in a deeply historical community that come to know God through the work that God does in our midst, meaning in the midst of human beings. When I say deeply historical, I'm not just talking about St. Michael's or St. George or the Diocese of Springfield, as historical as we are. I mean the community of the whole church, everywhere, including the community of the nation of Israel back through the prophets, through David and Solomon, back to Abraham and beyond, even to Noah way back to the beginning of human interaction with God in any way that prompted us to reflect on it. All through the scriptures, human beings have spoken of God in terms of their experience of God. Exposure and experience is how we know anything about anybody outside of ourselves. Everything else is hearsay and speculation. God acts in human history. Humans experience God's action and interpret it, interpret what it might mean, and then respond. God has therefore accumulated a, not a lot of names over the centuries. God the provider, God the savior, God the just, God almighty, God of gods, God the deliverer, creator God, God the holy one of Israel, there are dozens of names for God in the Hebrew Bible. And most of the time, God is named by what God does or has done. Then, in the burning bush incident, God tells Moses to call him by the name, I am that I am. Which is a way of acknowledging that names don't really apply. Because names describe and therefore limit they name. What this means, I think, is that God is saying, you can name me by all the experiences you have with what I do with you or for you, but I am so far above that, so much bigger than that, so far beyond, that there is no name that can be spoken to portray all of who I am or what I am. I am that I am. I do what I do. I will what I will. I am and that's it. And yet the same God seeks to dwell in some kind of community from the beginning. After all, the plural God says in Genesis 1, let us make humans in our image, according to our likeness. They will have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and the livestock and all the earth and the creatures that crawl on the earth. As Isaiah is called to his ministry of prophecy in today's reading, we are told, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. God dwelling in community creates creatures that must dwell in community as well. To love, to imagine, to build, to procreate and form complex relationships, to live in a kind of interdependent independence, to carry the image of the Creator. Now Jesus said, I and the Father are one. So what does God as Trinity mean for us? in real terms, every day. I am that I am becomes I am that I am in relationship to you, to you and to me. I am in relation to the world. I am in relation to us. If Jesus Christ and the Father are one, and if we are members of the body of Christ, then we ourselves are getting drawn into God the God that we know as Trinity. 
we don't make a fourth person of the Trinity, of course, but we believers have actually been made members of one of the members of the Trinity, of the Triune God. We are members of Jesus Christ, the Son. And the Holy Spirit is the means by which this happens. Remember Jesus breathing into his disciples the Holy Spirit. Remember the descent of the Holy Spirit on the crown of Pentecost. We celebrated that last week. The second letter of Peter tells us, His divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. By these he has given us a very great and precious promise so that through them you might share in the divine nature. So that you might share in the divine nature. What is the point of the Trinity in the first place? Ever wonder that? God in God's overwhelming wisdom and graciousness had a plan. A plan to reconcile and restore all that was lost to him through the rebellion of evil in the universe and in the world. It's a plan that includes us. A plan in which we continue his work as members who are one with God. Does this mean that we are God? No. Not by any means. Of course not. But it means that in some radical way that we cannot understand, God wants to make that which is separate from himself once again to be one with himself. And we, as we become one with him in Christ, then take on his mission as well. The Trinity, which is a constant, dynamic, and perfect interaction of diverse being, moving always in perfect relationship, never standing still, always moving toward the Father, toward the Son, toward the Spirit, also moves perfectly and powerfully toward everything that is created. We might say it is the towardness of God. Relationship. And God is perfect relationship. So God desires perfect relationship with us. The goal of the Trinity is not just some unending, happy ring dance in the sky, but it is the reconciliation and restoration of all things. You are one of those things that God is constantly trying to be one with. I am one of those things. Your neighbor is one of those things that God is constantly trying to be one with. The homeless that most of us never even see around here. The people that Jan and I have met in places like Belize and Africa and the Caribbean and Ukraine and in every country that all of you have ever been to, which is quite a few because the sun never sets on the U.S. military. All the people in every place that any of us have ever been to and in all the places we know nothing about. God wants to be reunited with them all. That it is people. That it is lives. God wants to be reunited with all of us, all of them, to make our lives once again into a part of God's life. God as Trinity may be a hard concept for us to grasp. It goes without saying. Only a handful of people over the centuries that even spent much time trying to figure it out and describe it in any detail. And that is as it should be. Imagine if all of us try it. Because the point of God as Trinity is movement. It is mission. It is the things that Holy Trinity does. God's mission. And just like God has been named by what God has done in history, providing, saving, defeating, protecting, loving, so also we have a name. We earn our name by what we do in relationship to the world. Just like our God. 
So put this on me. God is trying to scoop us all up into himself and save us through relationship. And he has. He has. And he does. He still does. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit include us in their eternal celebration. And what a celebration it is. The Father who is seated on the throne, high and lofty, as we picture him, whose robe fills the temple with smoke, is the same Father, or Mother, who runs to welcome his prodigal son home. He runs to embrace us, his prodigal children. The son who stood in the waters of the Jordan and was hailed by the, as the son by the Father and the Spirit, as the Spirit descended upon him like a dove, that same son calls us brothers and sisters and shares with us his inheritance because he has made us children of God. And the Spirit is the same Spirit by which we are reborn when we are born of water and spirit. The spirit that moved over the waters to bring forth life in the beginning brings forth life in us. This celebration of Trinity is our salvation. Come, let us celebrate the triune God that we cannot understand. Let us celebrate the many names of God who calls us to join in community with himself. Come, let us celebrate both our community and God's community. Let us celebrate.